good to be able to see you all and um yeah really exciting really excited to uh share this uh uh, challenging, I guess, in some ways, message uh, this morning as we um, look at, uh, we're going to be looking at Luke's version of the, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, which is actually the sermon at the bottom of the mountain, um, which we'll see in a moment. Uh, so if you have your, if you have a Bible available to you, um, I encourage you to open that up to Luke chapter six, uh, starting in verse 27. Uh, I'll have a translation on the screen, but it's, I think it's great to be able to compare translations, always really interesting and lots of fun. So uh, yeah, I encourage you, if you've got a Bible, good time to grab that and open it up to Luke chapter six, verse 27. Uh, so the plan this morning is uh, pretty simple. Um, I just want to start by kind of setting the scene and uh, having a look at uh, where Jesus is, is saying this, what's the context that um, Luke is presenting this sermon in, and uh, who's Jesus speaking to, who's there listening to this sermon. Uh, the majority of the time this morning, I'd like to um, focus in on verses 27 to 38. Uh, this is the really challenging teaching of loving our enemies. Uh, but this is what it looks like for us to love like Jesus. Uh, you know, we want to be people who are becoming unmistakably like Jesus. And this is what it looks like. Uh, and it's incredibly challenging, which is why uh, at the end in the, the second half of the sermon, Jesus reminds us of the importance of heart transformation. Um, having a transformation of our hearts is actually essential to loving like Jesus. If, um, if we want to love like Jesus, if we want to do what Jesus did, we need to become like Jesus. We need to have our hearts transformed to be like Jesus. Uh, we, we can't just do it by mustering it up in our own strength. And so for this, I want to point out just a couple of things in that last section, but really what I want to do when we get to there is I want us to um, just hear what Jesus has to say for himself, uh, because I think he, he says it great. So, um, so that's, that's kind of the plan for this morning. Uh, what I want to do before we kind of dive into it is I want to, for us to take a moment to think about what is it like for us to experience unconditional love? Uh, in, in a moment, Jim will put us into breakout rooms. Uh, and just with your group, I'd, I'd love for you to just talk about that. You know, we're about to talk about what it means to give love to those who do not deserve it, to those who will not give it back to us. So what does that feel like? What words or feelings come to your mind when it comes to unconditional love? And they are being, you're all being sucked back into the main session now. So hello, welcome back. <laughs> all right. Um, so maybe just, uh, yeah, a couple of thoughts or responses that people would like to share as to, you can put it in the chat as well if you prefer, um, but otherwise feel free to unmute. And what is it like to experience unconditional love? What thoughts or feelings come to mind? It's like freedom and you don't have to carry the burden of anything once you've repented. Mm. Yeah, absolute freedom. Yep, Tina's said something similar as well. Sometimes uh, it's hard to receive. Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, it's just about, um, it's all about acceptance and peace and just feeling totally overwhelmed by the beauty of it all and you are walking as Christ walked, forgiving. And mm. sometimes I'm forgiving and showing that unconditional love. And sometimes it takes a long while for it to actually happen. But when it does, like baby steps, when it yeah. does, it just, it's the most overwhelming feeling of um, peace and forgiveness. 
yeah yeah that's great Susie thank you yeah yeah I think um certainly for me um unconditional love just produces a feeling of gratitude within me because I did nothing to earn it I did nothing to deserve it and yet uh you know, it's given to me, whether that's something, uh, unconditional love that God's showing me or other people, uh, whenever I experience that kind of love, it's just, um, I just feel so grateful. And so that's the kind of love that we are um, going to be talking about. That's the kind of love that we are to be showing to other people. And it's important to um, remember that that's the kind of love that God has shown to us first before we show it to others god has shown us that same kind of unconditional love uh so i just want to really briefly um as we're um getting started just to set the scene uh just to describe where um this sermon is kind of coming in in the context of luke because luke is presenting this in a particular way uh, and so just a little bit up on chapter six and up, up to verse 17, uh, Jesus has just spent all night praying on the mountain uh, and he's uh, called his 12 disciples. And, uh, and it says, and he came down from the mountain. And so immediately Luke wants our minds to go back to Exodus, uh, back to Moses and Mount Sinai, because Moses was on Mount Sinai having an encounter with Yahweh. And he too came down the mountain to give the law to the people uh, to signify the beginning of the nation of Israel. And in the same way, Jesus has just been uh, on top of the mountain praying to God and he's come down the mountain and he's going to give commands uh, which signify what it means to live in God's kingdom. So the words of Jesus here that we're about to read carry the same weighty significance as the words of Moses at the beginning of Israel. And so he came down the, from the mountain with the 12 and he stood on a level place and a large crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all of Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast district of Tyre and Sidon. So do you notice the three groups who are here? You've got the disciples, uh, not only the 12 disciples, but a large crowd of his disciples are there. But then you also have a separate group, a great multitude of people. So these are people who are not Jesus' disciples. They haven't yet made that commitment to Jesus and his teaching. And these are people from Judea and Jerusalem, so likely Jews, and also from Tyre and Sidon, so Gentiles or people from the nations. So you have these three groups, the disciples, the Jews, and the Gentiles or the people from the nations. These three groups um, have come to hear uh, Jesus. And it says they've, came, they've come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. They have a twofold reason for being there. They want to hear him. They want to have their hearts transformed by his teaching. And they want to be healed. They want to have their bodies healed by his power. It's both of those things that they've come to experience. And the first thing that happens, the first thing they experience is his healing power. Uh, just imagine this scene. Just picture this scene as I, as I read the rest of this passage. It's just a phenomenal picture. It says, and those who were troubled by unclean spirits were cured. And the whole crowd was seeking to touch him because power was going out from him and healing them all. Power was going out from him and healing them all, not some of them, all of them. And these are people who, uh, you know, most of the people there probably have not yet made a commitment to Jesus. They haven't, they're not his disciples. These are just people who are interested and people who want to be healed. This is before Jesus gives this teaching we're about to read, where he's going to give commands as to what it means to live in the kingdom. Before any of that happens, Jesus gives uh, them an encounter with his goodness. Jesus is showing them grace here um, before they've done anything to deserve it. It's just a phenomenal picture, and I think it really sets the scene of, of what we're about to read. Uh, so we're going to dive into the passage in verse, starting at verse 27. And 
after we kind of unpack the loving your enemies uh, part of the sermon, I'd like us to talk about this question. So we're not going to talk about this yet, but uh, I'll give us a chance a little later on. So it's good just to think about this. Where do we see Jesus loving like this? So after I've unpacked um, the first few verses, I'm going to ask this question. So maybe think about that in the back of your minds as we as I start to unpack this, where do we see Jesus? What stories do we see where Jesus is loving like this? All right. So starting in verse 27, and um, probably the first thing to notice is that in the crowds, uh, it's those who are listening that Jesus is speaking to, those who are paying attention. The idea of listening is wrapped up in the idea of obeying. You know, to listen is to hear the voice, but also to obey the voice as well. So the question for us this morning is, Are we listening? Jesus says, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic also. Give to everyone who asks you. And from the one who takes away your things, do not ask for them back. This is, uh, this is a radical way of living. This is a reversal of how the world works. You know, the headline of this whole passage is love your enemies. I believe that this is the command that Jesus is giving and everything else is just an explanation of what that looks like. But the command that Jesus is giving is to love your enemies. Uh, and so the question is, because Jesus, we know that our ultimate enemy is the devil, but Jesus is not talking about the devil here. It seems clear to me that Jesus is talking about our human enemies. So the, the question is, who are you viewing as your enemy? What people do you view as the enemy? This is a really challenging question that we need to ask of ourselves. Uh, and let's just be honest at the moment, uh, for some of us, maybe we're viewing, maybe the people who are not following restrictions are who we view as the enemy because of the decisions that they're making. Or on the other hand, maybe we're, maybe it's the government that we're viewing as the enemy because of the decisions that they're making. Whoever it is, whoever you view as the enemy, that is who you are to love. That is who you are to do good to. That is who you are to bless and to pray for and to be generous towards. Whoever you view as your enemy is the object of your love. Whoever you view as the enemy is the object of your love. So this is really challenging and I just want to remind us of what I said at the start, that this is not about mustering this up in our own strength. We need a heart transformation. Uh, It's a radically different way of viewing the world, to to view the world where we can love our enemies, where our enemies can be the object of our love. So we need Jesus for this. We need a heart transformation for this. One of the really important things that Jesus is doing in this passage is he's amplifying the Old Testament laws so that love your neighbor becomes love your enemy. Lend without interest becomes lend without return. Uh, And I just want to talk about where Jesus says, if someone takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic also. Uh, The... uh, In the Old Testament, there was a law that if you were to get a loan off someone else, uh, they could uh, take your cloak kind of as collateral so that if you uh, weren't able to pay off the loan, the the cloak kind of guarantees that you would be able to pay it off. Um, And so this is an item of clothing that people would sleep in every night. So it needs to be returned each night. Uh, but it's a fairly inexpensive item of clothing. Whereas the tunic in the uh, Greek Old Testament, so in the ancient Greek version of the Old Testament, which uh, the first century Jews would be really familiar with, 
Uh, the word for tunic that Jesus uses is the same word that's used to uh, speak of the special tunic of uh, Joseph. Uh, a lot of us might be familiar with the translation of the coat of many colors. Uh, it's that same word, tunic. And uh, it's also the tunic that's uh, the tunic of fine linen that Aaron, the high priest, was to wear uh, for glory and for splendor. So the point is that the cloak was a fairly inexpensive item of clothing, whereas your tunic was an expensive item of clothing, a um, glorious uh, item of clothing. And Jesus is saying, if you take a loan, you know, don't just give your cloak as collateral, give your tunic as well. I think what Jesus is saying here is he's talking about our integrity. He's talking, he's saying that we are to be people who are so trustworthy that we could give away our most expensive items of clothing as a guarantee that we will do what we say we'll do. We are to be people of integrity. And I just love the way that Jesus looks at the Old Testament laws. You know, he's not throwing out the laws. He's not throwing out the Old Testament laws, but he's also not reading them to the letter of the law. What Jesus does is he is reading the spirit of the law. He's reading of the heart behind the law, the intention behind the law. I believe this is the correct way of reading our Old Testament laws. And before we move on, I just want to point out what Jesus says about uh, to the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. You know, Jesus is uh, not advising that we seek out mistreatment. He's not advising us to provoke people. He's not saying, oh, you missed a cheek. Uh, <laughs> what Jesus is saying is that, well, I think that just like Jesus um, reads the spirit of the law and not the letter of the law, we too need to read the spirit of Jesus' commands, not the letter of his commands. So remember the context, you know, Jesus is is saying these things in the context of loving our enemies. Later on, he's going to say uh, that we are to be just like God, who is kind and merciful to wicked people. See, God is not surprised when wicked people behave wickedly. That doesn't catch him off guard, and that doesn't stop him from showing them kindness and mercy. And so in the same way, we are to not be surprised when we show love to people and they don't accept it, or they even respond with violence. Jesus is not advising us to seek out mistreatment, but he's also saying that when people respond in that way, that other people's behavior do not determine our love for them, that Jesus is the one who determines our love for people, not them. All right, so let's, again, really simple, easy to follow commands. Um, no, we need a heart transformation. We need to keep that in mind as we read this. But let's continue. Uh, Jesus continues and he says, and just as you want people to do to you, do the same to them. And if you love those who love you, what kind of credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what kind of credit is that to you? Even the sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive back, what kind of credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners so that they may get back an equal amount. So Jesus here, he has this um, repeated phrase, what kind of credit is that to you? And the word credit there is the Greek word charis, or if you don't want to clear your throat, it's charis. Uh, and this, is, uh, this word is not usually translated as credit. It's usually translated grace or favor. Uh, the, this is the word for grace. So a more literal translation of this question would be, what kind of grace is there for you? Or to put it another way, what kind of grace do you have? If you only love those who love you, what kind of grace do you actually have? See, the kind of grace that we have is the kind of grace that not only saves us, but it's the kind of grace that transforms us to be 
completely new kinds of people. I love what Ephesians, uh, I love what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, that it's by grace that we are saved. And we're not saved from works. We're not saved from trying really hard. But we are saved in order to become a new creation, in order to be created in Christ Jesus for good works. So we are not saved from good works, but we are saved for good works. So what kind of grace do you actually have? See, the kind of grace that we believe we have received is the kind of grace that we will show to others. If we believe that, you know, we've earned God's grace and that we're really actually quite good people and that we on some level or another deserve the grace that God has given us, then we will be reluctant to Uh, show to be gracious towards those who in our eyes do not deserve it see our willingness I, I believe that our willingness to love our enemies our willingness to love those who do not love us will give us an insight into the grace that we believe we've received if you struggle to love those who do not deserve it then maybe what you need is a deeper revelation of the grace that God has already shown to you. So what kind of grace do you actually have? So Jesus continues. He kind of sums up everything he's been saying so far. And he says, but love your enemies and do good and lend expecting back nothing and your reward will be great. So that's interesting that we're supposed to lend without expecting back with expecting back nothing but then we have a reward. So Christianity is not about altruism. It's not about just doing good for no benefit. We do get a benefit, but the reward comes from God. It does not come from other people. And Jesus says, and you will be sons of the most high because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. Jesus says, you'll be sons of the most high. Uh, I don't believe that Jesus is saying that this is how we become sons of the most high. We need to read this in light of the rest of the Bible and the rest of the New Testament, which says that it's by faith that we become sons of God. But this phrase, sons of the most high, this is an important one. Uh, This is not the first time that this phrase has come up in the Gospel of Luke. In chapter one, it's the story of Jesus's birth. uh, And the angel Gabriel comes to Jesus's mother, Mary, and he says about Jesus that this one will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. So this title, son of the most high, this is a title that belongs to Jesus. Jesus is the son of the most high. So what Jesus is doing here is he's giving to us the title that belongs to him by living like this, by loving our enemies, by doing good and being generous. We are demonstrating that we are becoming unmistakably like Jesus. This is what it looks like for us to be unmistakably like Jesus, because he is gracious to those who do not deserve it and do not return it. And so he says that God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. And I want to just point out that word ungrateful, uh, because this is uh, similar to the word that we heard about just a moment ago, charis or charis. Uh, This is literally ungracious. It's a charis tos. It's the, it's the the negative of charis. Um, And so God is, God is a God who is gracious to the ungracious. He shows grace to those who do not show grace, to those who do not deserve it. This is the nature of God. This is what God is like. He is merciful and gracious to the ungracious and the wicked. And so just before we uh, go to that question that I mentioned earlier, I just want to look at these next two verses. Uh, Jesus continues and he says, and do not judge and you will never be judged and do not condemn and you will never be condemned. 
pardon and you will be pardoned. Give and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken, overflowing. They will pour out into your lap. For with the measure by which you measure out, it will be measured out to you in return. This is like a condensed version of everything that Jesus has just been saying. Because not judging, not condemning, you know, pardoning or forgiving and, and giving, being generous, this, this is what it looks like to love. So it's like a shortened version of everything Jesus has just said. But notice that it's also intensified or in extended. Jesus does not say, do not judge your enemies. He simply says, do not judge, meaning do not judge anyone. Do not condemn anyone, pardon or forgive everyone, give, be generous to everyone. And just imagine this, uh, just picture this good measure that we're given. It was like we're coming with this container and it's just being filled. It's being pressed down and shaken and then filled to the brim and then overflowing. And then beyond that, it's pouring out into our lap. This is the extravagant generosity of God being given to us. But notice that Jesus says the measure that you measure out will be measured to you in return. So if the measure that we're getting in return is this measure of extravagant generosity, then that means that the measure that we're giving out is one of extravagant generosity as well. Jesus is assuming that we will be extravagantly gener generous to other people and God will be extravagantly generous to us in return. This, again, is what it looks like to be unmistakably like Jesus. Because Jesus lives like this. And so this is our question that I want us to talk about in breakout rooms. Again, if you'd like to be part of the breakout room, that's great. If not, feel free to just, you know, ignore the prompt and just stay in the main room with us. That's, that's totally fine. Uh, but uh, yeah, geez, think about times, maybe just one or two of the things that I pointed out. Where do you see Jesus loving like this? Um, if you can't think of anything, that's totally fine, but at least have a go at, at thinking about that. have been brought back in um cool so uh yeah uh, i just noticed that uh christy mentioned in the chat that uh this looks like uh you know jesus on the cross where he says father forgive them they don't know what they're doing so that's a another great example are there any other examples that people either want to put in the chat or unmute and say out loud of where jesus is loving like this yeah, the woman caught in adultery. That's a, another great example. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think that for Jesus, just um, just sharing, you know, um, sharing meals with sinners is um, shows him not judging um, people and and just being with people. Yeah, washing Judas's feet. Uh, that's a great example. Feeding the five thousand, the catch of fish. Yeah, these are great examples of um, Jesus's love uh, that shows no bounds. When he gave more than what was asked, water into wine, loaves and fishes, many healings. Absolutely. Um, many ways, Jesus's extravagant generosity shows his love to those who do not deserve it. Um, that's great. Some, yeah, really, really great examples there of of love and so this is what it looks like you know remember our our vision is to be a part of our vision is to be unmistakably like jesus and uh and so this is this is what we're um called to be like and as we kind of come to a close uh in this second part i just want to 
mostly, I just want to point out a couple of things, but for the most part, I just want to, for us to hear what Jesus has to say himself, uh, because, you know, coming out of what Jesus has just been saying, we can be tempted to see the way that other people are not loving their enemies without seeing the way that we are not loving our enemies. And so Jesus addresses this straight away. And he's also told them a parable. Surely a blind person cannot lead the blind, can he? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not superior to his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. And why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the beam of wood that is in your own eye? How are you able to say to your brother, brother, allow me to remove the speck that is in your eye, while you yourself do not see the beam of wood in your own eye? Hypocrite. First, remove the beam of wood from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. So Jesus is drawing cartoons with words here. Uh, I mean, the pictures that he's painting are just ridiculous. The blind leading the blind and then falling into a pit or a beam of wood in our eyes. I mean, surely we're supposed to laugh. Uh, these pictures are absolutely ridiculous. Uh, but ridiculous pictures also help to drive home a point. And I think Jesus's point here is that sin is a distortion of our perception. Sin um, changes the way that we see things and make it, makes us unable um, to see things clearly. So if we have a beam of wood in our eye, we're going to do more damage than good when we uh, try to help other people. Jesus is asking us to be reflective before we're corrective of other people. And so we need to, he's not saying that we need to just ignore the sin of others. He's saying that first we need to ask Jesus, what is it in my own heart that needs to change? What is it within me that needs to come into alignment with the way that you see things, Jesus? See, heart transformation needs to come first. And that's what Jesus continues to talk about in the rest of our passage. Uh, he, he continues to, um, to talk about the need of heart transformation, which is followed by obedience. And I just want to um, let Jesus speak for himself in these verses and allow us to be challenged by it because obedience without a heart transformation is not going to result in anything sustainable. If we want to do what Jesus did, we need to have the same heart that Jesus has. We need our hearts to be transformed by Jesus. But also we cannot say that we have a transformed heart without that being followed by obedience. You cannot say Jesus is Lord and then not do what he says. The heart transformation and obedience go hand in hand. They, they both come together. So as we kind of come to the end here, let's just read what Jesus has to say. And even if you've heard this hundreds of times before, could I encourage you to allow this to sink deep into your heart? Let's read. For there is no good tree that produces bad fruit, nor, on the other hand, a bad tree that produces good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn plants, nor are grapes harvested from thorn bushes. The good person, out of the good treasury of his heart, brings forth good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasury, brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. And why do you call me, Lord, Lord? And do not do what I tell you. Everyone who comes to me and listens to my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug and went down deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood came, the river burst against that house and was not able to shake it because it had been built well. 
but the one who hears my words and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation, which the river burst against and immediately it collapsed and the collapse of that house was great. This is, this is challenging. May we be people who not only hear the voice of Jesus, but may we be people who are challenged by it. May we be people whose hearts are transformed to become more like the heart of Jesus. May we be transformed from the inside out. May we have a grace that transforms the way we live. I just wanted us to take a moment, wherever you are, whatever's going on in your house, I want us to just take a moment to be aware of the presence of God. Because the same Jesus who said these words is the same Jesus who is present with you right now by his spirit. Jesus is here with you. Jesus is speaking to you. He is a great communicator and you can hear his voice. So do whatever you need to do right now just to become aware of the presence of God. And what we're going to do is we're going to end by asking Jesus a couple of questions. Like I said, Jesus is a great communicator and you can hear what he's saying. And so I'm just going to give you 30 seconds for each question to hear what Jesus is saying. The reason for that is, at least in my experience, I tend to second guess things. Jesus will immediately speak to me. Something will come to my mind and I'll think, oh, that can't be it. So my encouragement to you is if it's uplifting, if it sounds like something that Jesus would say, then trust it. Even if it's weird, even if it doesn't make sense. When we ask Jesus these questions, just trust what you hear. It might be a weird picture or a weird phrase. Write it down uh, and have a conversation with Jesus about it later. All right, with that in mind, let's. Uh, the first question that I have for us is, Jesus, what do you want to transform in my heart today? Jesus, what do you want to transform in my heart today? Thank you, Jesus, that you're speaking to us. I thank you that we can hear you. If you need to um, write something down, take a moment to do that now. Um, write down what Jesus is saying to you um, so that you can continue the conversation with him. And I, and I just want us to talk about another question or ask Jesus another question now as well. Um, the question that I want us to ask, because again, you know, Jesus asked us, why, why call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? So a natural question coming out of that is simply, Jesus, what are you telling me to do this week? Again, it might be something, the most random thing, just pay attention to the first thing that comes to mind. So Jesus, what are you telling me to do this week?